I just brought a friend to make sure I don't get nervous, so he'll take a look at uh, what we'll go on. Good. The thing I'm going to talk about here is we have a nautical theme. And I'll talk about sailing in the perfect storm of user-generated content. So that's the basic idea. The point of departure for my story is Plato, as you see here, who has the notion of the ship of state. I needed a bit of inspiration, so I dug back in Plato's uh, The State and, and looked into what he thought about this ship as a metaphor. Plato's idea was that you know, the, the population at large would be kind of the, you know, the nearsighted, very, very powerful owner of a ship. And on the deck of this ship, there would be a lot of sailors milling about. That's the demagogues, the bureaucrats. And as the sailors competing for, for power, so they could, one of them could be the one at the helm of the ship. But nobody really paid attention to the stargazer, the navigator, the person who really knew how to set the course for the ship and direct it safely to harbor. So this is where I, I come from. So the ship as a metaphor is, we, is if we look at a ship coming into this big sea of user-generated content, the idea is you have the company as such. And the company is very powerful. It has a lot of marketing muscle and PR tools and so on. But it doesn't really understand this notion of user-generated content. What's the power in it and what is the opportunity? And you have all the quarreling sailors. That's the marketeers thinking, well, this is valuable in some way, but how can we use it? And also, the problem for the sailors is that they really don't understand this, and they can't control it, and then they don't see it as an opportunity. And of course, then there's the community people, the people who've tried this before. They're the stargazers, the navigators that are able to set the course. But the challenge for when, when you have to navigate this ship, it's, it's, it's a multidiscipline thing. It's both an academic discipline, where you need the active academic skills, but you also need the hands-on experience and try to do this for real before you're actually able to do it. There we go. So today's voyage has like three, three areas. You know, the first, before the voyage, the preparation. Then we have when you're at sea, what happens then? And finally, what things happen when you get ashore? So the preparation for the voyage. The thing that's interesting here is, you know, where are you going? What is actually the thing you want to do? But the main thing for, for this is, what is the actual goal of setting out on this voyage? Well, I'll tell you, the goal is to find a treasure. It's to go out there and discover the millions of pieces of very, very exciting content out there. In the LEGO community, we have more than 10,000 pieces of interesting stuff online. So, why is this important? Why is this valuable? Well, the reason why it's very valuable is because it creates a lot of attention. There's a lot of people who share this, there's a lot of people who see it, people who interact with it, and people who experience it. Not to mention the people who create it. All this attention is extremely valuable. Every time you know, a big worldwide event happens, then the LEGO community has some kind of answer. When Felix Baumgartner jumps from space, well, then the, the users create this in LEGO or reenact it. The same thing with the World Cup. So this is interesting. But why is attention valuable? Well, I'll go back to a couple of uh, Nobel Prize winners in economy. It's Ronald Coase and Herbert Simon here behind me. And they teach us that the notion of the scarce resource is what determines economy. So what is the most scarce resource back in history? Well, that was usually gold. And that was why gold defined the economy. When the European Union was founded, then it was steel and coal that was the scarce resource and thus defining the economy. In the information age, information and access to information was the scarce resource and thus very valuable. But today, there is more videos posted a day on YouTube that you can see in a month or even a year. And that means that attention is a scarce resource and thus making it very, very valuable. And this content that all the users create out there that cuts through all this information clutter and craves attention. And that is why it is so valuable. And sometimes, you know, you get attention that, that's really surprising. We've experienced that the most powerful man on the globe, President Barack Obama, tells us that he used to have some, or build some pretty mean Lego towers when he was a kid. Or even Kim Kardashian, that a couple of weeks ago started tweeting about she wanted a Lego Birkin bag. So these things not always are a good brand fit, but they're very, very valuable. The second, the, the second thing you need, you need to have a map. This is your insights. What goes on in the sea? Where is all this content? 
Where are the users? Who created? Where are they at? And I'll tell you just the, the, the very core of the LEGO community. We've estimated that they spend more than 400,000 um, hours on this each week. That's quite exciting. And you know, if you go away from just the core of the LEGO community, well, then this might be a lot bigger. But figure out who these people are. What makes them tick? And most of all, figure out how you keep them happy and stimulate them. There. So now we need to build a ship. Now we know where we're kind of going. We know why we're doing it. So we need to build a ship. Keep in mind that every ship is different for each company when you go out on the sea. You might have to go in with a big ocean liner because there's a lot of waves in the sea you're at. Or you might have a very small, nimble ship that can navigate shallow waters and, and small canals. So I'll take you through three things that we put on our ship at LEGO and, and tell you why we do it. The first thing is Rebrick. Rebrick is the sail. Rebrick, most of you probably don't know it, but it's a social media amplification tool where you, you know, we create links out to all the great fan sites, blogs, places where there's cool LEGO content and showcase it for the world. Keep in mind, most of the really exciting content comes from a small website or user's Flickr stream or Brickshelf or another place in the LEGO community and we want to take that out of the fan community and showcase it to the masses and thus celebrate our fans. So it means that when a, a cool wind is blowing from the fan community, we can hoist the sail and catch the wind and drive the vessel forward. And that is why it's the sail. So the second thing we have is the lookout. That's LEGO Kuzo. Kuzo means wish in Japanese and this is our crowdsourcing platform. The idea is that if you have a great idea, you put it on here and you can gather 10,000 people that are excited about it, then we'll review it for production, just like we did with the Shinkai submarine behind me or LEGO Minecraft. So how is this a lookout? Well, it's kind of at the top of our mast and looking all over the sea. And if it sees a big wave of user excitement, 10,000 actually, well, then we can ride this wave and thus take advantage of it and have, get the boat forward. And the final thing, is besides all the, you know, all the marketeers that are around on, on the ship here, we also need to get our LEGO ambassadors aboard and all the people from our LEGO fan community from the LEGO user groups. These are more than 150,000 people globally. And these people are the ones that share and create and they help us do a lot of these things and they have very, very deep knowledge of where all this content is. And th these are the people that we really, really want to engage with and we try and get them on board of our ship. So that's three things you can put on your ship. So now we take a look at where we want to go, how to build our ship. Let's see what, what happens when we're on the sea. You know, there's many dangers there. There's commercial fishing vessels, like, you know, <laughs> social media consultancies that has these big nets and they, where they try and pull out all the delicious fish without any kind of way of giving back or looking into how, how the ecosystem works. So you should be careful of those. But I'll show you a local example of how to find a current that you can ride on. The thing you see behind me here is, for all of you, that's LEGO Batman Arkham Asylum. It's Batman, it's a cool LEGO set, and there's a lot of villains. But for the people who, who in the fan community, this is something completely different. This has a product code that's 10937. Why is that interesting, you would ask? Well, it is interesting because this set is in fact built by a Portuguese LEGO designer called Marcos Bessa. And Marcos, he comes from the, one of the Portuguese lugs or LEGO user groups that's called Comunidade 0937. And why is this interesting? Well, actually, if you turn this upside down, it also spells LEGO. So this is some of the small innuendo and, and things we can use to communicate with our fans and thus communicate with them in a subtle way. And this also makes, makes all of us feel part of like a closed secret club where we can communicate in, in certain ways. So try to do this and find the local currents. We also would discover new colonies when we sail around the world. Every year when we do this, we find new colonies different places around the world. This is a, um, a small map of all the LEGO fan uh, events out there. Last year, I think there was almost 6 million people participating in fan organized events in the LEGO community. That means events that the fans put up that we don't like are a part of. We sometimes show up and do a keynote, but this is fan organized events where fans display their amazing LEGO creations where they take Lego and use it as a medium for creativity. And you need to discover these colonies because they're very valuable. Sometimes they're lonely out there like when we found a huge Lego user group in South Korea nobody knew about because there was all the problems with language. So we're now actively helping these people get in touch with other fans. 
So, storms can also arise, even for a company like Lego. Back in 2007, we decided to discontinue our 9-volt trains. If there's any Lego fans here, you are allowed to boo. Uh, but the problem with this was, you know, it, when we do products, we need, it needs to make sense business-wise. But the fans were very, very upset. So how, how do we remedy this? Well, the thing we did was invite all the fans in in a workshop and then develop the Lego FlexiTrack, which was a system of rails that we could produce that didn't cost a lot of money so the fans could still use their trains. And this is a way of writing off the storm when these things happen. Listen and involve people. So now we've built a ship, we know where we're going, and I've shown you some examples of how to navigate the sea. So what challenges hits you when you find a safe shore? Because you're not done yet. Well, the first notion I'll talk about is perceptual blindness. This is the thing where I'll go back in history to Christopher Columbus, one of the great seafarers of the world. And you know, when he had came in his big boats over to, to the Caribbean, and he sailed around some of the islands, he could see that on, on the islands there was actually some natives that were moving about there, but they didn't react to him, even though he was in this huge, massive ship with three masts. So that was a bit weird. He, did, he didn't understand that. So he went into the smaller boats, and then all of a sudden, when he came ashore, then the natives came and greeted him. And the problem with this was a notion of perceptual blindness. It means what you can't understand, you can't see. And the Indians, they'd never seen ships that big. They'd never even seen anything man-made that big, and not less on the water. So that meant that they actually couldn't see the ships. And that's the challenge with all this user-generated content. Because you don't understand it, and because you might not control it, that does not mean it doesn't pose a huge opportunity for you. So that's perceptual blindness. And it's been a, no, a struggle for me also overcoming this. So sometimes the crew, they commit mutiny. That happens. In uh, 1998, we came out with the Lego robotics called Mindstorms. It's basically an intelligent Lego brick that you can create robots that can do all sorts of things. But within a couple of weeks online, a lot of kind of images of how you opened up the Mindstorms box started to you short circuit the circuit boards and hotwire this uh, robot so it could do all sorts of things that we never intended. So what do you do when, when the, uh, uh, the, the crew commits mutiny? You know, the first reaction would be, well, they're messing with our product. Let's send the lawyers after them. But remember, these people are our most passionate fans. And how smart is it to try and fight the people who love you the most? Not very smart, right? So the thing we did, we tried to involve them instead. And that has actually showed that the next two generations of Mindstorms, the NXT, which we launched in 2005, and the um, EV3 that was launched about 14 uh, weeks ago, we've had fans in and helped us develop it. And that's been a good thing, because these fans have written more than 65 books. They've created 30 plus program languages and applications, and no, more, no less than 70 plus hardware accessories you can plug into this. So they've, in fact, expanded our product, made it more interesting and even better. And that's an opportunity. So make sure to take note when the crew commits mutiny. So what should you take out of all this? Well, remember that you might own your ship, but the ocean is extremely strong, and you can't control it. And just because you can't control it does not mean it doesn't pose a huge opportunity for you as a company. So the thing you can do, though, is you can follow these eight rules. It's just, you can create your own, depending on your community. But this is about making sure that you set expectations, you're reliable, and you ensure win-win and the rest of these things when you work with these people. You have to be fair. These things, these eight things, are really, really easy to say and very difficult to work with. But it's something that, that you should nonetheless try to do. So I have a final reflection. And if you could uh, roll the video now. The final reflection is when you set out on this journey here, you know, the sky is not even the limit. And these two guys, a guy called Matthew Ho and Azad Muhammad, they sent this little Lego guy into space last January. They're two students from, from a college in, um, in, in Canada. And you know, that is basically what you should remember when you set out building your boats. Make sure that it can go wherever you want to take you because the passion of these people, they can do amazing things. That's what I have for you today. Thank you so much.